be our goal. All right, well, thank you for those. And Kim, we'll hope that surgery will happen as soon as it can. And um, I think most folks know each other. I wanna introduce Stephanie Sweeney for those who maybe just came on. Um, she is new and her husband are the new caretakers um, out at Luther. And they've been very involved in our church since coming here. Um, and um, yeah, so it's just delightful to have Stephanie with us this morning. So um, let's see. All right. Well, I've got those prayer requests. Why don't I open us in prayer and we'll, we'll <coughs> topical Bible study going here. <laughs> Gracious and loving God, um, give us your spirit this morning as we delve into some important um, scriptures and certainly this uh, very um, challenging subject of Gehenna of hell. And so um, let it be fruitful and helpful for our faith walk and, um, and our witness. So give us your spirit. Um, we, we do pray for Kim's folks that you'll continue to watch over them now and their move. Um, we are tired of the smoke and, and people's health is being all throughout the West. We, the smoke kind of reminds us of all the suffering that so many have gone through um, in the West this year. Um, so we're mindful of them and we pray for all those still fighting those fires and um, we do pray for relief there. We think about the folks in Alabama and in the Gulf Coast with another hurricane and the flooding. Um, so many things to pray for, Lord. We commend them all to you and, and give thanks we can be together today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ah, okay. All right. So, um, you know, topical Bible studies are a little different in um, just the nature of things and how it works, uh, but really great to do. Um, but what I like to do anytime I'm doing that is to start with some texts, and then we'll go off from there. So um, the text that I want to start with is Matthew 25. So if you want to open your Bible to Matthew 25, I'm going to share my screen here now. Um, I've got a little bit of a, let's see here. Fix this so that you guys can see each other. Tools, we'll add sided by. So that'll push it over a little bit. And then we'll do this. Get as many of you on the side here for me to look at as possible. <laughs> um, yeah, Bob, I think you need a different background for a Bible study on hell. You know, I mean, you can't have you in paradise here while you <laughs> actually, that's a good, be a good contract. That's a good contrast for us. Um, yeah, all right. Compare and contrast. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, so let's let's go over here to Matthew twenty-five, and um, we hear a fair amount of talk about hell in this last part of Matthew. I have your coffee over here. Oh, here we go. So um, this is a famous passage uh, called the judgment of the nations. And so I just want to start with this text and then we'll, you will jump out from there and then wrestle with this difficult concept. So this is um, the par uh, a parable as such. When the Son of Man, but yet it's the telling kind of of you know the coming end of the age judgment type of thing. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, 
then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So this, this amplifies what was very prevalent. We can look in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Jesus's day. We see this in intertestamental literature of the Apocrypha of the Old Testament, and we certainly see it held up in the prophetic books of the Hebrew scriptures of our Old Testament canon, that, that the Messiah, with the coming of the Messiah, there would be this great battle. The angels and the Messiah would come and, you know, finish the job, so to speak. And so it wouldn't necessarily be all good news because the great day of the Lord would mean judgment. And since a lot of us are not, or, you know, or as Paul says, all of us fall short, um, it wouldn't be a good, necessarily a good news day. Um, but what happens in Jesus is that we see the Gospels claiming and Jesus claiming, uh, Jesus claiming and then the Gospels tell us what he said, that the kingdom, this day has come in Jesus, but not fully. It's like it's come, but not yet. So Jesus, the kingdom comes with Jesus, but he himself is talking about when the Son of Man, referring to himself, comes in glory. So that Okay, so when he comes to finish the job. So there you go. There's verse 31. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. So uh, a metaphor here um, of the, that the people of that day would readily understand. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. I love goats, so sorry, but anyway. And the king will say to those at his right hand, so the king now um, is the son of man. We get a merging here of this. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So if we're going to talk about Gehenna or hell, this would be the opposite of that. It's the place prepared for, um, you know, the, the sheep from the foundation of the world. And notice it's inherit. Um, a lot of people get wrapped up in this text as a works righteous text, but actually this word kind of just blows that out of the water. You don't inherit something you earn um, necessarily. I don't think you do. Maybe you could forfeit your inheritance, but you don't create it. But nonetheless, we keep going. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, a Lord, when? And certainly it's the righteous. God is righteous. So the righteous are the ones that inherit. Lord, when, did, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? All of this. And when it was that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you are naked in clothing and clothed you. And um, when was it that you were sick in prison and we visited you? And the king answered them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family. This is the new revised standard version of the Greek Adelphos, which is brothers, which was an inclusive term. It didn't just mean male brothers, but it was a term for Jesus's community, truthfully. So this the, the New Revised Standard Version's treatment here, or translation, members of my family, is certainly um, on target. Uh, so just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me. So this word depart is significant when it comes to Gehenna and hell. Um, when, you're, when you're removed from the presence of someone, um, and a lot of theologians will talk about hell as not being, you know, being removed from the presence of God. But that, so that imperative verb is important there. From me to the eternal fire prepared for the devil 
and his angels. Um, uh, Ionion is eternal and fire, this is the actual word for fire. So you get, you can see where Dante, when he wrote his book on hell, um, you know, we get this concept of fire that goes along with that. So go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me food, no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was stranger and you did not welcome me. So we get all the opposites of this. Um, and that, then they all say, Lord, when was it that we saw you? And in, in, in as much as you did not do it to the least, you did not do these this to me. And then here we have the word, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, I thought one of these words here um, were, the, was the word actually for hell, but um, we may have to dig down here a little bit with this then. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Ah, the, the word hell comes in here, but um, it may just be an allusion to what the concept is. Let's see, Matthew. Well, let's see, we'll go to 2333 just so we've got it. And this way I can, I'm doing this so I can just do a quick search. As I mentioned to a lot of you um, in the past, I'll just reiterate, you know, some weeks I have a lot of time for prep and some weeks we're just gonna be going along with this together because of time constraints, but we still wanna do our Bible study for sure. So um, this is fun. You can see how I do um, research a little bit and topical stuff. So um, I'm, if my computer will cooperate here, going to do a little Bible word study. <clears throat> and we're going to look here. And so here's the occurrences of the word. Let me see. I, I guess it isn't. It actually doesn't show up in Matthew 25. Um, so it's actually not Gehina, but it's this eternal fire. So a similar phrase. So let's go back. We'll, we'll look at some of these other texts in a minute, but let's go back here to, um, to this really interesting passage that talks about the concept of eternal punishment. Um, you know, so here, you know, we don't hear about Gehina, but we hear about this eternal punishment and the righteous to eternal life. The first thing I want to say about hell, which is a point I've made oftentimes in other studies, is that hell or e a place of eternal punishment is not, was never created, here's the eternal fire, prepared for human beings. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, obviously, these, these goats, so to speak, end up there. They depart. Um, they, but that wasn't a place prepared by God for people. So what this tells me about hell, first and foremost, is God doesn't want anybody to be there. Um, this is a little different from some of our other brothers and sisters that would talk about double predestination, um, because there is places where God hearts and this type of thing. And so I understand, um, where, um, you know, people, whoops, you know, come from on that, but, um, you know, hell is not really intended for human beings. Maybe God knows some people will wind up there. That, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, 
Uh, it, but this, so this parable, just to get us into the sea here, to start thinking about this concept. The one other point I want to make about this particular text is note that that oftentimes what we do with this text is we make it into a works righteous thing. Hey, the people who are going to be in heaven are the people who are compassionate. The people who are not going to be in heaven are the people that weren't compassionate. But note this one little thing that gets left out here oftentimes when we look at this text. So I'll go back to... Um, uh, you know, it's right here. Members of my family. It seems that this is a parable who is being judged here, not Christians, all the nations are being judged. So is this a, is this the way Christian people are received into heaven? I, it's just an interesting take on this, that this is the judgment of the nations and how, how they treated the least of these, not just any least of these, but the, the church, Jesus' followers. And here in Matthew, um, you know, the, Jesus is talking to his early, his first followers, his disciples, and Matthew includes this parable in his gospel. Hey, world you better take care of these followers because um, uh, you're, you know, you're going to, the judgment's going to come in this regard. It, it's, it's just a way to dig down deeper into this parable, but that maybe goes a little bit afield to our subject, which is what do we do with this concept of eternal punishment? This is a tough one. This is a difficult concept. So I want to stop sharing my screen, and I want to get some input from you now that we're into it. What mm -hmm. struggles do you have with the concept? And please, this is not a, mm, I'm going to judge you if you have trouble with hell. <laughs> I want to hear our legitimate struggles with this concept. Um, you know, this is a, I know this came up as a possible subject from prior Bible studies, but this is one that um, I remember one uh, older gal, sweet, sweet, just um, gal, she said to me in a foundations class, Pastor Bill, I just can't believe God would send anybody to hell, you know? And I go, yeah, I know it. I had a Methodist pastor who said to me, the God I know won't send anybody to hell, Bill. So what do you think about all that? Um, uh, what is, what, you know, maybe, and if, if you don't have any right now, we can just keep delving in and look at some other passages. Please, Kim. Well, I think, so thank you for doing this. I. I appreciate this picking this topic because it's something that I've really struggled with. And I think the thing that it's not so much the concept that there is a hell, it's the concept of Christ as judged um, because he's savior. And we, we love the kinder, gentler side of Jesus, but this judge is what I really have a difficult time with. And I, and I understand, you know, we've studied this passage a lot. And so I understand that he's merciful. And, you know, when he's talking about the righteous, we're covered in his righteousness. And so, you know, this isn't anything, we don't have to be afraid of this. But that um, judgmental part of Jesus, I really struggle with. Sure. Excellent. Excellent. Great question. Great, great aspect. And we will we'll definitely, you know, try and, you know, um, treat that a little bit here. I've got a couple ideas on that. Um, how about some others? Uh, one thing about judgmental, Christ judging, remember him cleansing the, te cleansing the temple. He's doing a lot of judging there. Yeah. So oh, he yeah. does come up and judge. And yeah. Cleansing the temple is a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do with that? Yeah. Good. 
What other struggles do you have with the concept? Please, Gloria. Well, I, I, I guess I don't have that much of a struggle because his word says it, and so I believe it. I mean, you know, he, he's true to his word. And, um, and I have a note in my Bible that says, hell is man's choice, not God's. And, and if someone chooses to totally reject Christ, that's their choice. And that maybe is where they're going to end up is out of the presence of God. And to me, out of the presence of God and um, eternal punishment, that sounds like hell to me. So I, I just wouldn't want to be there. Right. Yeah, I think what people come in on then at that point, Gloria, so thank you for sharing that. Um, because it actually, even though it's not a struggle for you, it opens up a struggle people have. You mean God isn't all powerful? God, people's choice is bigger and more powerful than God. Why would God, you know, allow such a thing to happen? <laughs> I'm not, I mean, we can- We're not, we're not, we're not robots though. I mean, we're not puppets. He, he, he gives us that choice. That, that's his grace. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's a good response to that. Bruce, yeah. Well, I just wonder <clears throat> why the devil gets all his power. He almost seems like co-equal with God in this. Uh, before mankind, there seems to have been a society or I guess society of gods and angels. Who, and then they decided to make man. But then a little bit later on, uh, the devil is given the power to take Jesus up on the hill and say, oh, you know, I can give you dominion over all this. Where does he get that power? Yeah. Yeah, so so, uh, so a, a little spin-off question about the devil and his power. Where does that come from? Yeah, we can look that up too. Um, good, good. All right, I'm writing these down, so I'm not going to just. Uh, well, I'll skip over the hard ones. And, you know. <laughs> um, so, are there other questions or stuff, particular little aspects of this con this subject? These are all perfect and appropriate that I can. Yeah, Stephanie. Yeah, I just I think I struggle with when talking to people who are non-Christians about hell, um, because I feel like as a Christian, I can think about hell and be like, that's the place I don't wanna go, but to, for people who aren't Christians, um, trying to explain that to them in a, a way to say God is loving, but then all those questions that we're talking about, like trying to kind of give that in a nutshell to someone who's like, I don't know, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, great versus or you know because we the average non-christian person or unchurched person they've maybe seen some christians on tv or the people standing outside big sports events or concerts with the bullhorns you know saying you know you're going to hell and you know this type of thing and so how do you bring that up and not and I don't know if this is your question, but for me, when I hear what your question is, how can I talk about that and not look like the bullhorn guy? You know, <laughs> is that kind of my, yeah. yeah, good. Excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah. Doug. Yeah. What I have to always go back to or go, or go deeper to is what is the nature of God that, you know, how do we, def how do we look at, the Lord, um, because we know that he's all loving. We know that he's omniscient and omnipresent and all those fancy words that describe him. He wants everyone, <clears throat> he loves everyone and he wants everyone to love him. So he wants everybody to turn out to be a sheep and not a goat, right? Okay, but, um, but, he's, but his nature is perfect. So, uh, being all those things, he cannot, um, he just can't associate with wrongdoing or with, um, that's why, that's why we needed Jesus. So that's probably enough. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I that's what I was heading good. for. Yeah, well, the question, the part of it is how do we square hell with the attributes of God? And, 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 you know, if we come at it from the attributes of God kind of angle, um, you know, we could say, well, God is all merciful, so hasn't, but then also God is just and righteous. Like you said, God can't dwell with unholiness. You know, unholiness and God don't mix. Um, uh, so, so, you know, if God, if there is no hell, is God just? You know, that's a question. That's what I would have, that's what I said to my Methodist pastor friend who said, the God I believe in couldn't send anybody to hell. And to me, without a hell, you know, I, I, I don't know about the, you know, the, the, anyway, that's the tension there. So, yeah, good, 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 good. Okay, any others? And we'll start, yeah, Kathy. Hell has been Kathy such a, a threat for so long, it seems like, you know, like, if you don't do right, you're going to go to hell, you know, and, and I'm talking way back and like, you know, when people, you know, way back in time, it's always been sort of a big threat, not that God's held it over people's head, but preachers, you know, the hell and brimstone and fire and brimstone sermons that, you know, we don't get them so much today, but in the, you know, it was such a threat. So now I think, um, I think that's confused people or people have looked at God like, okay, what is he? <laughs> is he a loving God or is he the guy who's going to zap me to hell or something? You know, I think that's colored uh, people's um, when they look at God, what he's like. Yeah. Yeah. Billy Graham was probably the, a softer side of this, believe it or not, compared to some of the the Jonathan Edwards type preach uh, of the Great Awakening back, you know, 100 years ago, two, 150 years ago, you know, where they would do the fire and brimstone and here's the answer, you know, and, and kind of scare people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and and I've, I've always been very critical of that kind of methodology, I guess you could say. Um, but, you know, Jesus actually, let's, let's take a look at a few passages here. Because Jesus kind of you, talks about it that way. Um, so, so, yeah, let that, let's, let's, let's use that comment, Kathy, to, to launch us into looking at a few scriptures here. Uh, I'll go back to sharing the screen here. Um, you know, yeah, go ahead. One thing that brings to mind a, a different way kind of is um, for some reason in one of our little studies this week, we read about how Jesus zapped and killed the fig tree. And and I read in a little commentary below that, or, yeah, that really the fig tree wasn't even supposed to be producing at that time, but it was, Jesus was hungry, hangry or something hungry. And he, um, yeah, he just kind of made it wither because it wasn't producing. And I get how that can be a picture of, we need to always be producing. Um, but still I thought, really? That seems like a very human thing to do. Not very divine. I don't know. Just saying. Excellent. Excellent comment. Of course, he's half human. I mean, he's part human, so, you know, but I mean. But maybe that was the God part of Jesus and not just the human part. Maybe. Let, let's That's think a little about, scary. Yes, but <laughs> let's think about, um, let's think about the stories uh, in the Old Testament um, God, God actually goes out to kill Moses at one point. He uh, says to Abraham, you know, sacrifice your son. Of course, that's an in, there's an intervention there. Um, he, uh, he says in Isaiah, 
Isaiah, your job, I'm calling you, and you're going you're gonna to go and make sure nobody listens. You're, everybody's ears are going to be stopped up and nobody's going to listen. So what's God doing here? What's Jesus doing in cursing that fig tree? Um, it, it definitely blows our concept of what's fair out of the water. And um, so, Kathy, I guess the thing that you make me think of is that God sometimes kills so he can raise up. Mm. kills to kill forever but 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 and and i don't even mean literally kills but he kills our presumption of righteousness in order to raise up new life um and that's what i see happening all the time in the hebrew scriptures and in the new testament that that you know we we have our calculations and god just won't you know, abide by that. I, I even think of, uh, well, this gets into the sermon a little bit on Sunday, but um, that I've got to preach in a, <laughs> about an hour and get it recorded. Um, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, what do they want in the garden? It, the, the, the English translations are that the devil says, if you eat of that, you'll know good. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but it actually the word knowledge, it's not just knowing like, oh, I know now what's right and wrong. They knew already what was right and wrong. God did. But really what that's talking about is that they get to decide what's right and wrong. They wow. get to be in charge. Hmm. So how does God deal with this? Well, God sometimes does stuff that totally does not match up <laughs> with our standards or even it would seem sometimes god's standards um but he, god is always right there to reissue repost or however we want to put it reapply his promise and his goodness so so it does seem like a part of our struggle there is um what stephen paulson and many Lu gerhard ferdy and many well, Luther himself would say, God speaks in two different words in scripture, law and gospel. Um, and, and so, yeah, sometimes God, <laughs> you know, and maybe that's what you just said is a perfect segue into thinking about how Jesus uses the term. Um, let's take a couple of these. I've got a little word search here for Gehina. Now, I also should, let's, let's just look at, let's just look at um, the Bible dictionary real quick. Hell or hell fire. The word is derived from the Hebrew Gehinon, meaning Valley of Gehinon, also known in the Old Testament as the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, located west of and south of Jerusalem and running into the Kidron Valley at a point opposite the modern village of Silwan, the Valley of Hinnom once formed part of the boundary between the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. <sighs> Let's see. So this is just historical stuff. Um, yeah, this is important. Uh, it became the site of an in infamous high place called Topheth and derived from the, an Aramaic word meaning fireplace, where some of the kings of Judah engaged in forbidden religious practices, including human sacrifice by fire. Because of this, Jeremiah spoke of its impending judgment and destruction. King Josiah put an end to these practices by destroying and defiling the high place in the valley of Hinnom, the second kings. Probably because of these associations with fire, destruction, and judgment, the word Gehina came to be used metaphorically during the intertestamental period as the, a destination for hell or eternal damnation. In the New Testament, the word is used only in this way and never as a geographic place name. So even though the geographic place name had a connotation and a history that most of the people Jesus is talking to would know about, it was a garbage dump, it was a place where things were burned and these horrible things were done in the past. By, by Jesus' time, it's now a metaphor 
Um, and that's the way Jesus uses it. As such, Kihina is to be distinguished from Hades, which is either the abode of all the dead in general. So these, these we got to get more specificity here. Um, in Acts 2.27, um, um, that's a quote from, of a psalm. Um, there's another quote there. Um, so the, sometimes there's overlap between Gehenna and Hades, but, but the, we probably should, being more precise, we can make it dis distinguish those two. Or the place where the wicked await the final judgment. So maybe Hades is a place of awaiting the final judgment. So whereas some people go to heaven and wait the final judgment, some people um, are in Hades type of thing. By contrast, the righteous enter paradise or a state of bliss immediately upon death. You've got the thief on the cross here. Um, Jesus warned his disciples of committing sins that would lead to Gehenna. And these are the passages we're going to look at here. In the New Testament, Gehenna designates the place or state of the final punishment of the wicked. It is variously described as a fiery furnace, an unquenchable fire, or an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So this is, um, so, um, so Gehenna, hell is the literal, is the English of the, of the, of the Greek and then Hebrew background word here. So when you look at the way Jesus uses it, um, let's just, let's just maybe go to Mark 9, 5, 45. You know, this is that really difficult you know, phrase where, you know, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell or Gehenna. That's the, the Greek there. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't saying people should maim themselves or tear out their eye. The, the, the feet were, and the eye, these all represented actions. Like, so if something's you know, if your eye, you know, what, if what you're doing is causing you to sin, you know, deal with that. Um, so, uh, uh, but we get this reference, and you can see why some Christian pastors have used hell to scare people. Um, hey, deal with stuff, because otherwise you're going to go to hell, where worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Um, uh, you get this interesting little at the end of that that passage um, but let's see um, Matt this is this is another spot um, this is the uh, um, just as the weeds are collected and burned up in the with fire so will it will be at the end of the age the son of man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all the evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here, the son of man, you get this Jewish apocalyptic sense, is going to, you know, the, the evildoers, God is just. God isn't going to leave, you know, things that are unjust, you know, in that state. Um, but then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. So here's another important text when it comes to hell. And if we trust that the gospels are bringing us Jesus and his teachings, Jesus talked a lot about hell. There's no escaping that. <laughs> um, now, I think he is using metaphor, as Jesus does a lot. But nonetheless, um, those are some important texts. Let me let me pause and see what your um, your you know your reactions to those texts are so far. And I I'm not abandoning you know. So yeah, maybe if we use those texts and come at Stephanie's question, how then should we talk about hell with other people? Um, you know, how can we do this and not just be you know the bullhorn guy screaming at people, you know, <laughs> um, you know, how do we, you know, I know a lot of, a lot of, let me just say some of the answers I've heard, Stephanie, 
some well-meaning Christians just don't, we don't talk about hell anymore. We just, you know, we don't want to be fear mongering. So we just let it go. Some very compassionate Christians who just are so rooted in the graciousness and goodness of God, just say, you know, I just don't believe if God is who God is, that God could actually do that. <laughs> so what do we do with Jesus's words then? <laughs> you know, I mean, that a little bit goes back to what Gloria said. Well, God said it, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to, but, but how do we make that translation? How can that concept be something that is helpful for people versus unhelpful is a great question. And I'm definitely looking to everybody to help Stephanie and figure that out. <laughs> How do we do it? Is there a way to do this? Please, Stephanie. Or Stephanie. And of Stephanie. I think when you talk to, when you talk to people that um, if, you, if they first understand the promises of God and the character of God and that it's like you said it's kind of their choice then if they understand that and then they learn about hell they're like okay well I'm good you know what I mean like they just they understand who God is and they understand that it's their they need to make a choice to follow him or to not follow him and you know it's kind of up to them, then it, it's not as threatening, I guess. Mm-hmm. Helpful. Good. Yeah. Well, people who don't know God are already kind of choosing not to have a relationship with him, not to have or, or not to, um, to go their own way and not to, you know, uh, to be apart from God, they're already kind of making that choice. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there are people who are, I realize who have don't ha haven't heard the word, but um, you know, in most modern society, that you know, it, it, they have, and they've either decided they can make it on their own, and so in a way, they've already made that choice, and you've got to sort of change their mind. Yeah. I think some though people have the they have assumptions about who God is or or religion and the way I face. And I think sometimes when they hear the real truth, they're surprised when they're like, oh, I didn't realize that's how it was. Mm-hmm. In that spirit, I think one way we can talk to people about hell is to say, I don't like this concept. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't make it not real. I don't, the, the concept of people being eternally apart from God is horribly, a, is a horrible notion to me. I think we as Christians should be very clear. We think we, we think, one, like I already said, hell was never made by God for any one person. No human being was ever intended to be in hell. That's the first thing people need to know. Secondly, yeah, it's an awful concept. It's an awful concept. But maybe thirdly, it's almost an, a necessary um, reality um, going back to what you said, Glory, about us not being robots, it almost is a necessary reality for, um, for us to be created in God's image. And I, I get a little uncomfortable with the choosing, but, but I like the, the receiving, you know, that we can decide we are not going to receive the gift God's given us. You know, I, Jesus says all those who receive in the Gospel of John all the time. He says, I chose you, you didn't choose me. So, so, but without getting into those semantics, you know, that, that, um, you know, for us to be free people, 
at some level, that reality has to be there. The other thing I would jump in to say, if I actually got to have a conversation with a, you know, someone that maybe was a non-Christian or just someone outside the church, to say that let's be clear that you know these are the talk about eternal fire and whatnot. That's a metaphor. Um, so we got to be careful about being overly literal about that, like Dante's thing, you know, you know, Jesus does it too. He says, you know, unquenchable fire. But again, these are metaphors. Um, I, I personally think about hell as um, being uh, apart, like depart from me, Jesus says, being apart from the presence of God. We want to go it alone and God says, okay, eventually, you know, in the end, if that's our absolute thing, God lets us have what we want, and that's to be apart from him. Um, and to me, that is, that, is, that is kind of the way I think about, about hell. So I don't know. I think those are C.S. Lewis, Stephanie, um, let's see, uh, if you guys want to do some additional reading. Um, one of the books of C.S. Lewis that I appreciated the most from a, a systematic theology standpoint is The Problem of Pain, um, is the name of the book. Um, and in that, he has a chapter on it. Okay. Um, and uh, couple couple things. Uh, let me just read a little bit from him. Um, um, and it has been admitted throughout that man, human beings, have free will and that all gifts to humanity are therefore two-edged. From these premises, it follows directly that divine, the divine labor to redeem the world cannot be certain of succeeding as regards every individual soul. If that was, if it could, if we could be certain of that, then um, there wouldn't be the freedom, which is what we've been talking about already. Some will not be redeemed. There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. So um, I think, Stephanie, it's really helpful for us to make sure when we're talking with other people about hell, to say that because we don't want anybody to be in hell. We get no, that's what I get some of the bullhorn guys. It's like some people like, oh yeah, man, they're, he's gonna send those bad people to hell. Man, if that's, if I, I don't want anybody to be in hell, how can be, I be a Christ follower and, and, and forgive 70 times seven, like Jesus says I'm to do, and want anybody to be in hell? Now, I'm a human being, so, Sure, I, I have those feelings sometimes about people that do horrible, disgusting, rot, you know, evil things. But in the end, I really don't want, and, and actually, and, uh, <laughs> if, if, you know, unrighteous, if it's the unrighteous that go to Gehina, then I don't want, you know, all of us are going there without Christ type of thing. That's, that's where we end up, which gets really scary and really difficult. But but I don't want that to be. And, and like C.S. Lewis says, I'd love to get rid of that doctrine, but can't. Um, it has full support of scripture. That's Gloria's point. Um, and our Lord's words, it has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason too, because when you start reasoning it out, you really can't doesn't work you know, without that. If a, if a game is played, it must be possible to lose it. If the happiness of a creature lies in self-surrender, no one can make that surrender but himself, though many can help him to make it, and he may refuse. Um, so this is kind of some of the stuff we've talked about. Um, and, uh, and I won't go on I'll, you know, with his, well, because it, it's not that long, but it actually makes some really interesting and important points. Um, I have another quote by C.S. Lewis. Okay, good. That I, I wrote down in his definition of hell. 
a man can't be taken to hell or sent to hell. You can only get there on your own steam. Yeah, all right, good. And that maybe is a perfect segue to look at Kim's question about, you know, um, which if I got it right, um, the judge that Christ is judging and, you know, sending people to hell, like this, the king in that parable where he sends the goats off. Um, a, a, another passage that's maybe helpful, so thank, thanks for that, Bert, that's, that's perfect, is the famous John 3.16, but we don't want to stop there. <laughs> um, we know this passage, right? Um, can you see that, John 3.16 there? I think I'm still sharing on my screen. You're not. Oh, here, <laughs> let me. Um, oh, I was reading from C.S. Lewis, and you guys weren't seeing it, were you? Okay. So. What was the name of his book? The Problem of Pain. And this is the, uh, so it's got, um, these are the different chapters, now that, I, now that you can see it. Um, divine omnipotence, divine goodness, human wickedness, the fall of human beings, human pain, human pain, continued hell, animal pain, and then heaven. So next week when we talk about heaven, we'll we'll check we'll check this one out. But I was through the church's wonderful support of my continuing education, and I got all of C.S. Lewis's. Uh, not not his uh they don't have his you know lion which or the the novel type books but they've got all <laughs> systematic stuff here so um so that's the problem of pain is um, what i was reading from and so bert thank you for that great quote from c.s lewis and it probably comes from later in this chapter um what did i, I think i I got mixed up here in my spot. There we go. Um, so, um, but I, yeah, I love that he says that. Oh gosh, I could, wish I could get rid of the reality. You know, I think that is a great bridge for us just to admit, wow, I really wrestle with this concept too. Um, I think that's a helpful bridge, Stephanie. I hope that's helpful. Okay, but back to Kim's question here about Jesus being the judge and sending people. So John, Jesus in the Gospel of John gives us a little different take on it, and it kind of flows, I think C.S. Lewis's quote that Bert shared with us kind of flows here. So if we go on, and don't stop at John 3.16, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. So this is the word um, krino, which is judge, consider, separate, um, you know, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So Jesus, even though, again, we have to be careful with that Matthew 25 parable, because is this, the judge? this is the judge of the nations and how they treat the church. I don't know. You guys decide. You think that, think on that. But, but if we take all of scripture together and what Jesus is saying, Jesus, God did not send him or the son into the world to condemn. Again, that kind of does go along, doesn't it, with that concept that God doesn't want anybody in hell. Um, God wants us saved. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light <laughs> come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Um, interesting um, follow-up that Jesus gives us here. Um, and before this, he's talked about those who have been born from above. You, you have to be born from above. So those who are born from above love the light. Well, why? Because we are we're clothed in Christ, but those who don't, who love darkness. So, you know, we, the way I hear this, to bring some modern authors in, those who love being on their own, those who love being in charge, those who love not being accountable to anybody but themselves, 
they choose that. So Bert's quote from C.S. Lewis really jumps off the page here. The Jesus doesn't send people to hell, so to speak. People do. People choose that. People, you know, um, come at it that way. That Pastor? Make- yeah, please. Um, I'm going to try to stay out of the politics of things and just try to make a commentary here that what I'm seeing on the news is pure evil. When somebody walks up 15 feet, my, my, uh, my, my nephew is a cop in North Carolina, so this kind of hits home for me. But when somebody walks up 20 feet to a police cruiser and opens fire on people with no provocation, it just tells me that there's just flat out evil in this world, you know, and, 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 and we, and we keep talking about people willfully walking away from God, but what about people succumbing to evil? I mean, is, do you have any comments on that? Well, you know, I mean, there are lots of examples of people succumbing to evil um, on all sides of this thing. You know, we've seen police officers do horrible things. We've seen, we've got drug lords killing and murdering people. We got despots all over the world doing pure evil. We got, you know, we absolutely, human beings love the darkness. And we see examples of that all over the place. Um, But yeah, so I guess my comment is just, yeah, that's been going on since the beginning of time. Slavery has been going on since the beginning of time. Is there a greater evil than that, where you make someone a cattle and a non-human being? That's disgusting. And the fact that we thought that that was okay. Um, So, you know, yeah, I I guess, Bruce, I'd say, yeah, that makes me sick to my stomach. But um, I guess the what I would actually say is that um, in response to that would be to point you to my devotional last week that there are two problems that I think scripture addresses most clearly, and that's our human nature, our sinful nature, and powers and principalities that we give into. And so the person that could go up and shoot a police officer and feel justified by it is giving in to the principality of death and violence. Just as somebody in an authority position who abuses their authority, you know, is giving in to that principality. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think it's, you know, and the concept of hell is that, you know, we're, um, got that, that there's consequences to um, us choosing and, and loving the darkness. Um, and so I guess that's where I'd bring hell into this, to your comment, Bruce, or question. I don't know if I answered your question, but we can point to all kinds of things every day that are examples of people, you know, on the on the wrong headed in the wrong in being governed by the wrong force others want to jump in on that kim sure yeah um you know it's cases like that where i think we're kind of glad there's a hell because we you know it makes sense to us that things like that are punished and that appeals to our sense of justice um but the times that I personally struggle with it are, you know, we've talked about this before where family members might be at risk and, um, you know, people that we love and we, we don't want it to be true then, you know, so we kind of want it to go both ways. Yes. Um, yeah, Kim, that's exactly right. It's, it's not hard to think about a Hitler or Stalin or, you know, Paul Pot or, you know, some of these people being in hell. But that really good person that we love, who probably is a more, does more moral things than we do, being in hell, that's the kicker, isn't it? 
Yeah. I, I wonder if we don't get into big, big trouble when we decide who's going to go into heaven and who's going to go to hell. I'm very Amen. thankful it's not my job. It's, it's Jesus' job. And uh, leave it up to him. But uh, because there's no way I know why people are motivated to do this, do that, or the other thing. Yeah, no, no question. That that's a big help, Bert, to, for us to remember that. Fortunately, we're not the arbiters of that. Um, it's still a struggle because there's this concept, you know, of eternal punishment or eternal separation from God. And, you know, we're told in the New Testament on the positive side, and this maybe gets to what you're saying, the way not to be there is to be connected to Christ. The way to, to not have the reality of hell being our destiny, I guess you could say, is to be in Christ. And so then just by nature, we think, well, if somebody's not in Christ, then they must be. In. And so we're not like wanting to be the judge, but then we almost have to wrestle with the possibility that, you know, these people we love who are so moral and good, you know, might end up being there. And that's, I think, the difficulty that comes in. But no doubt that we have to finish the end of our, we have to put the balm of God's being the judge, then we're not, and we don't have, we're not the ones in that position. We have, that, that has to come rushing in here. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you made me think of, Kim, um, this a scenario that C.S. Lewis brings up here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, notice here, too, oh, this is really good. I'm not going to try. Am I sharing my screen now or no? No. Oh, oh shoot. Um, I keep doing that. Just interrupt me if you think. <laughs> so the, I'm not going to try and prove the doctrine tolerable. It isn't tolerable to us. Let us make no mistake, it's not tolerable, but I think the doctrine can be shown to be moral and by a critique of the objections ordinarily made or felt against it. So, you know, um, and that's what we've been talking about here. But um, comes up with this, let's see. Yeah. Oh, okay, here we go. I've begun with this conception of hell as a positive re re retributive punishment inflicted by God because that is the form in which the doctor is most repellent. And I wished to tackle the strongest objection. But of course, though, our Lord often speaks of hell as a sentence inflicted by a tribunal. He also says elsewhere that the judgment consists in the very fact that people prefer darkness to light and um, that not he, but his word judges men. Um, this is an important and helpful um, thing, and we just read that text. We are therefore at liberty, since the two conceptions in the long run mean the same thing, to think of this bad man's perdition not as a sentence imposed on him, but as the mere fact of being what he is. So he set up earlier, he set up this person who's just thoroughly evil. You know, the kind, Kim, like we were talking about, the kind of people that's like, yeah, there should be a hell for that kind of, those kind of people. Um, uh, the characteristic of lost souls is their rejection of everything that is not simply themselves. Um, our imaginary egoist that he, and again, I didn't read it for you, but he does a beautiful job setting up how rotten this person is, has tried to turn everything he meets um, into a province or appendage of the self. The taste for the other, that is, the very capacity for enjoying good is quenched in him ex except insofar as his body still draws him into some rudimentary contact with the outer world. Death removes this last contact. He has his wish to lie wholly in the self and to make the best of what he finds there. And what he finds there is hell. In other words, it, you get what you, you want. And that's kind of where Bert was going. But 
you know, so he talks about all these objections, um, but I want to get to the last one because this kind of gets the thing we were talking about, Kim, with what about the, what about, yeah, here we go. This is the end of his thing. In the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? Wipe out their past sins at all costs to give them a fresh start, smoothing every difficulty and offering every miraculous help. But he has done so on Calvary. Forgive them. They will not be forgiven. To leave them alone, alas, I'm afraid that is what he does. At the end, you know, so it's like God has tried everything and it, he lets them have what they have. One caution, and I have done in order to rouse modern minds to an understanding of the issues, I ventured to introduce in this chapter a picture of the sort of bad man whom we most easily perceive to be truly bad. That's what you're talking about, Kim. But when the picture has done that work, the sooner it is forgotten, the better. In all discussions of hell, we would keep steadily before our eyes the possible damnation, not of our enemies, nor our friends, since both of these disturb the reason, but of ourselves. This chapter is not about your wife or your son, nor about Nero or Judas Iscariot. It is about you and me. Mm -hmm. that goes back to what you were saying is that hey we'll let god be god and we're not going to worry about other people's hell but let's kind of focus on our own anyway really good stuff there hey pastor yeah uh, i really like the part that really helped me the most and what you read there was when he had in the quotation marks by the word it's not god doesn't send us to hell it, but his word makes it clear where you're destined for in other words it, it's what you choose god didn't choose it you chose it yeah 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 you you don't receive the gift you you shut yourself off mm -hmm. yeah 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 mr bill please i you know in the um years ago we used to say the creed jesus descended into hell and now we say descended to the dead. It um, was hell just like a mistranslation. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not as up to speed on that as I probably should be. But I did do quite a bit of research back when we went to the new hymnal and they made that change. Um, and it is. <sighs> A better they did that because a better case can be made that descended to the dead is more ancient, more true to the original, the way the creed that was written, mm -hmm. um, and but it becomes hell and it gets equated with it, and so it isn't just a tra it is a translation issue, and what is the best, you know best way to be true to the original. However, it is tremendously theological, Kathy. Oh, I wonder. That, that change. Um, and I've really wrestled with it. Um, I like the harrowing of hell that Jesus went and preached. You know, there wasn't any place that didn't hear the good news. That, that's what the theological, we, we call the harrowing of hell. Um, that the victory of Christ there's no place that doesn't hear and see that. I think descended to the dead is a little bit truer to the one scriptural reference to support that phrase. It's the second Peter where Jesus goes and preaches to the spirits in prison. That's, that's the biblical support for that, that, mm. you know, um, phrase from the uh, apostles creed. So it's, uh, you know, I'm glad they still put the little asterisks because, um, you know, both of those have some help. Both of those have good parts of it. I'd have to say I prefer to hell because, you know, there wasn't anywhere that didn't get the good news and that the victory of Christ didn't get, you know, applied to. Um, so, and I 
don't know, and this is where the theology comes rushing in, is hell is an unpopular thing to talk about. And even a lot of pastors in mainline Christianity reject the concept. Um, I don't know if that was part of the motivation for that change. What I've told and read is that no, it's a debate about what's the most authentic to the original. Pastor Bill, I, I know it's probably conjecture because it doesn't really say, but do you think that that um, visitation of Christ to the dead or to hell was a one-time thing, or um, do you think that that's something that's available to people that haven't heard about him? Yeah. Yeah, I, it sounds to me scripturally that that's what happened when he died and was raised, you know, that it was a one-time thing. But that, I love your, so that's the way it sounds to me. Now, it could be, you know, I don't know. Um, the, this gets maybe to the last question, and we're kind of out of time here. Um, you know, one of our retired pastors has told me many times that he just believes in all his heart that, that you get one more chance after you die. Ken, Ken Jacobson. <laughs> right? I'm not saying who it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I've heard the story. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, and I I want to be with him in that. I mean, I I I want that for people. I can't make the case for it scripturally, but I hope it's true. I I can't make the case for universal salvation scripturally, but I hope it's true. I don't want anybody to be in hell but it's a reality and you know we need to we 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 need to be able to talk about that um but i you know scripture doesn't allow me to go there rob bell's famous book or it's not maybe not famous to you guys but love wins is just the latest emanation of you know saying you know look no one's going to go to hell you know well I mean, that's a nice conjecture on his part. I hope he's right, but I can't make it squared on scripture. You know, <laughs> that, that, that goes back to Bert's comment. If I, and actually this goes back to something that um, Dwayne Preeby, Pastor Jonathan Systematics Lutheran theologian said is, um, you know, saying everybody goes to heaven or saying certain people go, you know, us putting ourselves in that position. Oh, everybody's going to be saved. Or, you know, only certain people are going to be saved. It's this. Uh-oh. We lost you. <laughs> we lost you, Pastor Bill. We're back. Can't hear him. No sound. Um, no video either. Almost everybody. I don't know how. I didn't do anything. <laughs> there you are. Well, only four of us remain. <laughs> so oh, I'll, I'll just finish up then by saying for the recording and for the Facebook people, I guess. Or actually, yeah. Um, that it's the same, it's the same coin, it's just different sides of the same coin. To say we know who's being saved, that everybody's being saved, or only certain people are being saved, it's the same thing. We're putting ourselves in that position, which is what Bert comment and what you mentioned. So um, so anyway, because scripturally we just can't make it go. All right. Well, I'm sorry we lost. I have no idea why. Welcome back. They're, they're coming back. They're like coming it. back. They're I have Stephanie. no idea what. I have no idea what happened. So, <laughs> um, I have another quick thought on our Matthew scripture. Yeah. The example that we're given are relatively small events: visiting the sick and clothing the the, the, the naked and that sort of a thing. And uh, I'll go back to C.S. Lewis, who said, if you're going to talk about evil things and good things, it's best not to start with Hitler. Go to small things that we all experience and we can all do. 
you know, right. it's very obvious that the person that, that, that shoots cops cold-bloodedly or, or the Hitlers or that sort of thing. But it's, it's hard for me anyway to relate to those sort of things, but I certainly can relate to being visited when I'm sick or visiting some friend when he's sick or that type of a thing. That's, those were good examples that Christ used in Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look at Lazarus. Remember him? That rich man and Lazarus and the rich man went to hell. But it was because he didn't help the poor man and the poor man was up in heaven. You know that story. Yeah. It's that was it's the same thing. He didn't help the poor man and give him any help. And then he wanted it from heaven from that. Let please let him come help me now. You know, give me thirst, you know, quench my thirst. So the images are kind of there in the Bible, definitely. Oh yeah, there's the images are there. That parable, um, I think he's in Hades, actually, just not to be too precise. On it. But um, you know, I think if we take the whole of Scripture, uh, it, are we righteous or are we not? And that's where you know, you know, the rich man. Is it, because, is it because he didn't help the poor man or was it because he had rejected God and as such, of course, he didn't help the poor man, you know, that's, yeah. that, that's the yeah. fine thing because we can make all of these into, okay, well, this is the way we as human beings get to be in control. We just set the law. We got to be compassionate. As long as we're compassionate, we're going to be in heaven. And, but how compassionate do you have to be? You know, <laughs> where does it kick over to being good enough? You know, and that's where we get into that trap. Um, and, but anyway, so, well, this has been a great study and I'm sorry we lost a lot of people, but let's close in prayer and you guys have a great day. And next week we're going to do heaven. Okay. Do hell. We might as well do heaven. And then, I'm, I'll be waiting for your topics. All right, let's pray. Thank you, God, for this time together. Bless us in the rest of our day. Um, keep us, keep your grip upon our lives. We commend our world to you, and we pray that, um, as you've told us in Paul's letter to Timothy, that you desire all people to come to the saving knowledge. Christ Jesus. And so that's what we pray for um, as we ponder um, the concept of hell today. And we pray all of this trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay, troops, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Bill. Can I give you a good word? I was I was late getting here because I've been on the phone. I've had you pray for my granddaughter, Zoe. Her fever broke, and it turns out that she probably had um, pneumonia with bacteria because the antibiotics finally kicked in, and, and, and she's well now. Wow. We were That's really cool. worried that she was in really bad shape, you know, had that long haul, you know, COVID thing or whatever going on. But uh, finally... Finally, everything broke last night, so praise God and thank you for your prayers. How old is she? About 22. Yeah, and was she confirmed to have COVID? No, she never did. It's one of those things, and you've heard about these people who don't test positive for COVID, but yet the antibodies show up later that they did have it. So we kind of thought that Zoe was in that category, but... <clears throat> The doctors wisely started out with antibiotics, and then if they didn't work, they were going to do steroids in case it was viral pneumonia. And, uh, you know, it's hard for us humans to be patient. Yeah. She was on her last uh, yeah. uh, dose of uh, antibiotics, and then, boom, she just kind of snapped out of it, and we just pray yeah. that she stayed that way. I'm so glad to hear that, Bruce. That's awesome. Thank, thank you very much for your prayers. You bet. You bet. Right. Okay, gang. We got off topic a little bit, but I wanted to ask you, you've always 
uh, reference these uh, bullhead uh, type preachers. How do you feel about the preacher taking off his mask as a oh, as a saying that uh, we don't believe enough or something? I don't get it. Yeah, I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, and and, and the group that you know, I think it's ridiculous. Um, you know.